So in our talk about the elbow dislocations, we will start with an introduction. So elbow dislocation is the second most common large joint dislocation in adults, which accounts for up to 25% of large joint dislocations in adults. And it is the first most common large joint dislocation in children. And elbow dislocation mostly affects younger patients aged 10 to 20 years due to sports injuries and high energy injuries like road traffic accidents. And that is because the elbow is a highly stable joint and it requires a considerable amount of force to be dislocated. And that is why it mostly dislocates in sports injuries and high energy injuries and it really dislocates in simple falls. Now to really understand the elbow dislocation, first we have to understand the anatomy of the elbow joint. So the elbow is a hinge type of synovial joint and it is formed by the articulation of the capitulum and trochlea of the distal humerus with the radial head and trochlear notch of the radius and ulna respectively. So as you can see in this picture here, the elbow joint is formed by the articulation of the capitulum and trochlea of the distal humerus with the radial head and trochlear notch of the radius and ulna. And the articular surfaces of these bones are almost in full contact with each other, leading to higher stability of the elbow joint. And the joint is covered by a joint capsule that surrounds the elbow joint and provides more stability. And as you can see in these pictures here, so on the left, we have an anterior view of the elbow joint and on the right picture we have an posterior view of the elbow joint showing the elbow capsule. So the elbow capsule adds more stability to the joint. Now the elbow joint is furtherly stabilized by ligaments and those ligaments include the radial collateral ligament, the annular ligament and the ulnar collateral ligament. So the radial collateral ligament connects the lateral epicondyle of the humerus with the annular ligament. So as you can see in those pictures here, so those showing the ligaments of the elbow joint and on the left we have the anterior view and on the right we have the posterior view. So on the posterior view, on the lateral side of the elbow, we can see the radial collateral ligament here. This is the radial collateral ligament. It connects the lateral epicondyle of the distal humerus with the annular ligament. This is here the annular ligament. This is here on the posterior and this is the annular ligament on the anterior. Now regarding the annular ligament of the radius, so the annular ligament encircles the radial head into the ulnar notch. So the annular ligament starts in the ulna and ends on the ulna and it encircles the radial head. So it go around the radial head and goes back into the ulna as you can see right here. So it stabilizes the radial head into the ul ulnar notch. And we also have the ulnar collateral ligament. So the ulnar collateral ligament connects the medial epicondyle of the humerus to the coronoid process and the olecranon of the ulna. And it contains two bands. It contains an anterior band and a posterior band. And the ulnar collateral ligament is the biggest ligament of the three. So as you can see in those pictures here, so on the anterior, we have the ulnar collateral ligament here. And also we can see the anterior band 
of the ulnar collateral ligament here and on the posterior view we have the posterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament now muscles around the elbow joint also help in stabilizing the joint those include the common flexors those originating from the medial epicondyle and then we have the common extensors originating from, from the lateral epicondyle and we also have muscles like the brachialis triceps and so on and all of these factors mentioned make the elbow joint a highly stable joint but sometimes dislocation occurs now let's talk about what happens to the anatomy when the dislocation occurs what we call the pathological anatomy of the elbow joint so when the elbow dislocates this may lead to bony injury such as a radial head fracture or a coronoid process fracture or the two together we may also have a capsular injury capsular injury almost occur in all dislocations and we may also have a ligament injury ligament injury also occur in most dislocations especially the medial collateral ligament and we may have a muscle injury and we also may add the vascular and nerve injury those also could occur like the brachial artery injury or the median ulnar nerves injuries now in simple dislocations there will be no bone injury but the capsule and ligaments will be injured however the elbow will be reduced and it will still be stable after reduction so generally speaking we have simple and complex dislocations simple dislocations are the dislocations where there is no bony injury and the complex dislocations are the dislocations where there is bony injury added to the dislocation so in simple dislocations there will be no bony injury but the capsule and ligaments will be injured however when we reduce the elbow the elbow will still be stable after reduction and the injury would have a good prognosis now in complex elbow dislocations there will be bone injury in association with the capsular and ligamentous injuries the radial head being the most common associated fracture with the elbow dislocation and the coronary process of the ulna being the second most common bony injury occurring in addition to the elbow dislocation now in these injuries where there is elbow dislocation and only one fracture so it is either a radial head fracture or a coronary process fracture then the elbow will also be stable after reduction in most cases but in cases where all of these three come together like the elbow dislocation occurring with the radial head fracture and the coronary process fractures all together then this is called the terrible triad injury and in this case the elbow will be unstable after reduction with bad prognosis meaning there will be recurrent dislocations and there will be osteoarthritis now let's talk about the classification so the elbow dislocations are classified according to the direction of displacement of the forearm relative to the arm into posterior in 90 percent of cases anterior medial lateral and convergent so elbow dislocations are classified according to the direction of displacement of the forearm relative to the arm and they are classified into posterior meaning the forearm will be displaced posteriorly and that is the most common type in 90 percent of the cases and then we also have an anterior dislocation and we also have a medial dislocation and a lateral dislocation now we will talk about the convergent elbow dislocation a little bit later in this video now elbow dislocations 
are also classified into symbol and complex, which we already talked about. So symbol elbow dislocations is without associated fracture, meaning without associated bony injury, and complex is with associated fracture, like the coronary process or the radial head. Now, since we already talked about the radial head fractures in another video of this class, now let's talk about the coronary process fracture classification. So the ulnar coronary process, which is here, as you can see in this picture, so this is the coronoid, and here is the olecranon. So the ulnar coronoid process is classified according to Reagan and Mori classification. And Reagan and Mori classifies coronoid process fractures according to the size of the fractured fragment. So it really classifies them according to size into three types, type 1, type 2, and type 3. In type 1, the fracture of the coronoid process is of the tip of the coronoid process, meaning there is a small fragment that is fractured. So here on this picture, if we have a type 1 coronary process fracture, it will be just for the tip of the coronoid. Now type 2 is a fracture of less than 50% of the coronoid process fragment, and type 3 is a fracture of more than 50% of the coronary process fragment. So type 2 would be less than 50%, and type 3 would be more than 50% of the coronary process fragment. Now, since we already talked about the theory behind elbow dislocations, now let's talk about what matters clinically. So, the clinical features of elbow dislocation, so regarding symptoms, the patient will be present with elbow pain and deformity, and the patient elbow is usually held in a slight flexion and supported by the other hand. And this is similar to the other injuries of the elbow. They usually present with pain and the patient would be supporting their elbow with the other hand. Now regarding the physical examination, so the physical examination is look, feel, move. On looking, the elbow is swollen, there is elbow swelling, there might be ecchymosis around the elbow, and deformity is usually obvious. Now on feeling, so feeling the elbow is usually very hard because the patient is in severe pain, but if you have the chance to feel the elbow, there will be tenderness on pressure around the elbow, and the bony landmarks, the olecranon, and the epicondyles may be abnormally placed. And on feeling, you also check the radial pulse and compare it with the other hand to make sure no vascular injury is sustained. And the neurological examination will reveal the ulnar nerve injury in most cases. And on moving, so you ask the patient to move their elbow and they will refuse to move their elbow because they are in severe pain. Now let's talk about the imaging and elbow dislocations. So the plain radiographs are enough for diagnosis. So you order an anterior posterior and a lateral elbow radiographs and those usually enough for diagnosis. And the CT scanning may be required for surgical planning and assessment. So the anterior posterior and the lateral elbow x-rays will show the dislocation and the radiocapitular line is drawn to make it easier to spot the dislocation. So as you can see in this x-rays here, so this is a lateral elbow x-rays and you will draw the radiocapitular line which is like that from the center of the radius bone and forward and this line should go through the center of the capital lump but here it gone up meaning there is a dislocation of the elbow and also on this x-rays you can easily see that the joint is non-congruent here so clearly there is a dislocation and the challenge with the plain radiographs 
is to identify the associated injuries. And during your description of the elbow radiographs, the dislocation direction has to be described, meaning either posterior, anterior, medial, lateral, or convergent. Also, the associated fractures and injuries should also be described in the report. Now, on this x-rays, the dislocation is divergent. Now, in divergent dislocation, the radius will be dislocating to, the, to one side and the ulna dislocating to the other side. And that is because we have an ulnohumeral, meaning this joint, and a radiohumeral, meaning this joint, and a paroxysmal radio ulnar, meaning this joint, they all dislocated. So in convergent dislocation, all of these joints are dislocated, leading to the radius going in one side, the ulna going to the other side. Because normally, in posterior dislocations, anterior dislocations, medial and lateral, the radius and ulna go together. So in posterior dislocation, for example, the radius will be sticking to the ulna and going posteriorly. But here you can see that either of them are on one side and the other on the other side. Now let's talk about the associated injuries with the elbow dislocations. So commonly we would have a radial head fracture, a coronoid process fracture, or the two together, leading to a terrible triad injury, or we may have a medial epicondyle fracture, and that is mostly in children. Moving on to talk about the treatment of elbow dislocations. So the simple elbow dislocations, meaning the ones that are not associated with the fractures, are treated non-operatively with the closed reduction. And for elbow closed reduction, we have two maneuvers. The first one is that the patient is placed supine and procedural sedation is usually required. And you ask an assistant to provide counter traction on the proximal humerus while you hold the patient wrist with one hand and the dislocated elbow is manipulated from the underside by the other hand. And with the hand that is under the elbow, you reduce any medial to lateral displacement first with your hand that is under the elbow and then you apply traction using both hands with the flexion of the patient elbow to 90 degrees until the elbow relocates. Now regarding the elbow close reduction, second maneuver. So in this maneuver, you ask an assistant to hold the patient wrist. So this time the assistant is holding the patient wrist, not you, and they would apply traction with a flexion. And you hold and push the olecranon distally, anteriorly and medially using your thumbs. So they would hold the patient wrist and you would hold the patient elbow. And they would apply traction and flexion and you would manipulate the elbow back into position. After reduction, reduction is confirmed by assessing the full range of motion and varus and valgus truss application on the elbow joint to make sure that it's relocated. And after that, the elbow is immobilized in above elbow back slab with 90 degrees of flexion for one week and then exercises are started. And you repeat the radiographs to make sure reduction is good and the joint is congruent, meaning the joint space is equal along the articular surfaces of the joint and you repeat the neurological examination looking for any injuries that occurred during the reduction. Now let's talk about the indications of operative treatment. So operative treatment is required when there is a failure of closed reduction and when there is joint instability, meaning when there is recurrent dislocations and operative treatment is required when there is a complex fracture dislocations, 
because those require reduction and management of the fractures and damaged soft tissues. And operative management of elbow injuries usually carries poor prognosis due to secondary osteoarthritis. Finally, let's talk about the complications of elbow dislocations. So we have the complications that occur early in the, in the dislocation, and those include the nerve injury and the vascular injury. So in nerve injury, we have the ulnar nerve being the most common to be injured, especially with posterior dislocations. And this usually would lead to neuropraxia of the ulnar nerve, which will heal on its own during an eight weeks period of time. In nerve injury, we also have a median nerve that can be injured. It may be entrapped during close reduction of the posterior dislocations. And we also have the radial nerve also could be injured. And in complications, we also have the brachial artery injury. This is also an early complication, especially with anterior dislocations. And when the brachial artery is injured, it requires emergency surgery to repair the artery. And other complications also include a stiffness. A stiffness is usually loss of the 20 to 30 degrees of terminal extension of the elbow and it is caused by prolonged immobilization. That is why the patient are advised to move their elbow as soon as possible to prevent stiffness. Another complication is heterotopic ossification. This would lead to more stiffness. And another complication is recurrent dislocations. This is most commonly caused by radial collateral ligament incompetence and fracture dislocations. And finally, we have the secondary osteoarthritis as a complication of elbow dislocations. And with that, we reach the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please give us a like and comment your ideas and questions. And this video is a part of a bigger class. It's called the Elbow and Forearm Trauma Masterclass. You can check it out, it will be available in the video description.